I want to keep this informal since it's a small group. To the extent that any questions come up, uh, please go ahead and uh, just go ahead and you know turn your microphone on and jump in or put it in the chat. I do have a chat box open, so I could keep an eye on that uh, off to the side. Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about the decision making. Uh, this is going to be the topic for this month, and I have a number of discussion that I'll be starting uh, throughout the next few weeks. I started this as a standalone looking at challenges and opportunities, and then it kind of built into an overview. And then it further built into thinking about this as really one of uh, really three parts. Okay. So coming up then in two weeks, we'll be looking at alternatives. I'm going to be touching a few instances today about different ways organizations approach decision making, but I'm going to go a deeper dive into how some of these leading edge organizations are thinking differently about how they approach decisions, how they involve people. This will go deeper than into looking at distributing authority, which is behind uh, as a foundation for decision making, but taking care of the fear of anarchy. A lot of times, if people are moving from a very controlling organization, distributing authority, they fear that people will go off on tangents. And there's ways to keep that from happening. And then at the end of the month, we're going to be talking a little bit more about decision making in the new era organization, how we can think differently about decision making. And this is kind of a summary to pull a num number of things uh, together and then really bring it back to futocracy as to the principles there and how they uh, build a tension that keeps the anarchy from uh, rearing its ugly head. Okay. Going forward then, I'm going to be talking about a number of things today, looking at uh, decisions, but within some framework. When you think about decision making, my initial thought well, is it's kind of isolated, but it's really not. It's it's part of a stream from problem solving to really taking care of the problem. And it's really that midpoint. But there's a number of things along the way that we can talk about that really are part of that backbone for decision making. We'll talk briefly about who's involved and more importantly, why they are involved or should be involved. I've got some interesting information on the decision methodology. I'm not sure I have a total grasp of all the possibilities. And that's still kind of evolving in my head, including you know, the selection criteria uh, behind the decisions themselves. Um, we've talked in the past about categories of decisions. I've seen some rough ideas about that. We'll be bringing out more of that throughout uh, this month with some of the discussions. Um, then also there's some fear and risk associated with decision-making. And really this is bi-directional. It's the fear of delegating the authority for decisions that the decisions aren't gonna be done uh, proper as that person might uh, think they should be done. But there's an also the receiving end of decision-making. You know, Are they prepared? Uh, do they, exist in an organization that if there's mistakes, will they be punished? A number of uh, fears there. And then the developing of decision-making competency. I'll did touch really briefly on this. This will be brought out more in the next session where we talk about alternatives, about how different organizations approach decision-making from a, uh, various points of view and what types of competencies are involved in making those uh, transitions. Okay. Looking then from problem solving to decision making, this is looking at the full process that gives some context for decision making. And I was thinking about you know, what really triggers change. Uh, and that's part of this process. And generally is recognizing some symptom of a problem. Rarely do you understand the problem to begin with, which you see as the symptoms. And too often, that's where they stop. They focus on the symptoms themselves, when in reality, more research is needed to go into what is the core problem. If you don't solve the core problem, the symptoms will just pop up in a different uh, venue. 
Uh, this is sometimes called uh, push down pop up management. You push down one problem, but you're only pushing down the symptom. So it pops up in another symptom uh, somewhere else. Then it's also looking at the options. How do you generate options? What are the procedures, the constraints on option setting? Those options then really sets the stage of how are you going to decide? This is the deciding how to decide. Uh, rarely do organizations even think about this. Most often there's a paradigm of decision-making process that's in place that uh, process is employed without really thinking about is it the best in general or is it even the best for a specific decision uh, itself? It's just kind of you know, the background you know, what is what we normally do and we don't think about it. Uh, this then leads into the selection criteria. If you've got a number of options, how do you decide among the options? What are the criteria that you use for making that selection? Okay. Then who makes a decision and how is the decision actually made? This is this is kind of where I originally started, the decision-making process itself. But when I was thinking about it, the first five steps really need to be in place before the decision is actually made itself. And oftentimes the focus in different articles and books about decision-making really focuses just on the decision-making itself, who and the how are decisions made without thinking about all the other really precursors that lead up to this point. But then also the most important is what do you do with the decision? This is the implementation. And this is where decision-making has a direct tie into organizational change. Because if there's a problem, that implies something needs to be changed. And the decision then is a trigger for that change action to take place. So once a decision is made, that's when you kind of tr transition into the next phase of actually implementing the decision. This then raises the question on where things can go wrong. And oftentimes we think about the implementation of the change is where it goes wrong. But when you look through the process leading up to it, there's a number of areas where problems can occur without really any attention being paid to them. They just pop up because we don't pay attention. For example, the issue of solving the symptoms versus the, the problem. The, the diagnostic section of decision-making and change is really at this point here. And when I teach students, I really have to tell students the truth and that very often organizations do a very poor, if any type of research or analysis into the problem itself. There's a number of very good tools that make sense of how organizations operate, where the problems occur, what's driving the problems, what's uh, behind trying to encourage the resolution of the problems. But too often organizations jump to the first politically feasible solution. Okay, And because it's politically feasible, they will often ignore a lot of other possibilities because... They're either not easily attempted or they're outside the easy uh, politics for getting people on board or whoever might be a strong decision-making uh, point in the organization might need a little bit more encouragement to get off of the uh, status quo. So again, the whole issue of the analysis is often glossed over and not done in depth. And the generation of of options. There's a number of interesting ways here to bring people into the process. But again, oftentimes the decision making group, the problem solving team, the implementation team for change is a very small team and often not directly associated with the problem itself. They are seen as the outside experts on process. And oftentimes they don't have the expertise because they haven't been involved. They're not directly impacted. And again, as I mentioned earlier, 
rarely do we even think about the decision-making process. We just use what's been uh, in place. The selection criteria is an interesting area where things can go wrong of how do you determine what criteria are critical and the relative weighting. Rarely is there one perfect solution to a problem. Generally, students are taught that in their earlier coursework and that there's always one perfect solution and their challenge is to find it. In reality, when they get into their later courses or when they get into the workforce, they find out that virtually every solution has some constraint to it or some possible unattended consequence in that there's always some side issues that are associated with any decision. And very often it's not a selection um, for the best, but a selection among many good possible solutions. So you're always deciding which is the best among several that are all, all good, but that decision of what is best is really somewhat judgmental in many cases. And the key isn't necessarily the choice, but also recognition on what may go wrong so you can quickly identify that you did make the wrong choice and determine it for the scenario analysis how you would react. Okay. And then the decision itself, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, who needs to be involved, how they're involved. And then you get into obviously a whole series of where things can go wrong in the implementation process itself. Okay. Moving forward then into who is involved and in what ways are they involved? Okay. This really gets down to a number of, of different ways of looking at you know, people, their involvement in organizations, their roles in organization. I started off here with who is impacted. This is an obvious choice because they're the ones that have the uh, skin in the game, so to speak. They're the ones that are facing the customer, the supplier, the operational issues that they're feeling the symptoms themselves. Okay. And this is obviously a critical group of people that absolutely need to be involved, but oftentimes they're not. They may they may surface the issue, but the old traditional industrial era mindset often rears its ugly head in that the manager class is thought to be the knowledgeable decision makers. And those that are workers don't have the knowledge or the expertise to make those decisions. They're, they're knowledgeable enough to identify the symptom of a problem, but not much more. Now, that's and really, like I said, the industrial era model that goes back 100, 200 years, but to the extent that in many organizations today, that is still somewhat a mindset that's in place. And that as you go up in an organization, you somehow, uh, through some miracle of promotion, become more knowledgeable, more expert in decision making, are capable of handling the bigger decisions, the more financial risk key decisions, but at the same time, they get more removed from that knowledge that often is essential in making the decisions themselves, or at least selecting and identifying the issue at a core level. Then there's also who's responsible. This gets into, again, how authority is delegated, who is responsible, oftentimes relative to job descriptions uh, versus roles. We've had a number of conversations in the past moving away from job descriptions to roles. They're much more flexible, uh, capable of dealing with the changes in the, the workplace as necessary. But within a traditional organization, there's really a lot that gets down to who's responsible. Um, question, go ahead. Um, Dr. Ross, I just have a question regarding involving those who are impacted, right? Um, okay. Please let me know if my connection is clear. Uh, I know I was struggling a bit with it. Can you hear me clearly? 
Yes, go ahead. You're talking about uh, how to involve those people? Yes, who are impacted. Um, you okay. mentioned now that often um, we go about involving managers, okay. but they surely are not as close, um, you know, to the reality of what's happening on the ground as those who are directly impacted. My concern with involving those who are directly impacted sometimes has to do with the numbers, right? Because um, often those who are impacted, you could be dealing with, um, let's say, for instance, 500 employees who are impacted by this. And um, for example, depending on the change, it could also be in different business units, right? Perhaps a thousand employees, but they are all they are all impacted somewhat differently, perhaps because of the business unit in which they are in. And therefore, reaching out to the line manager, for example, becomes the next best solution because they have a holistic idea of, they should at least have a holistic idea of what's happening in their team. And they can therefore relay the message very easily. And you can then be able to pick up the nuances that are happening within the team by by talking to the line manager. Yeah. So if if that's sort of not the um the best way to go about it, like I, I just want to understand that a little bit better. Yeah. Um, you're you're on a a good tr line of thinking, and I've got some answers coming up in the, I think the next slide after this one, but part of it is uh, is a series of steps. Uh, first off is an awareness that you don't know everything that you might need to know. Uh, again, you may know some of the things you don't know. Rarely will you know the things that you don't know because you haven't recognized it yet. Uh, those things are to be discovered. Uh, you're also talking about an interesting issue of scaling. The implications of large numbers of people who may be uh, impacted by the change. There's a number of ways to approach this as to um, how to involve people, either collectively or through some type of rep representation. Um, I'll hold that for just a little bit, and I'm going to try to remember to come back to that as an issue uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, let me go forward then on this one. In addition to responsible, then who has the authority? Uh, this gets into the budget, the available resources, but increasingly even people's time. How can you allocate people's time to work on a particular project? Oftentimes the decision-making, the resolution through the change process is an additional workload that puts a further burden on people, unless there is some type of recognition that some things can be deprioritized or uh, different activities can be moved around. So again, th the issue of who's impacted, who's responsible, who's got the authority then to take action comes back to who has the necessary expertise. So the, the people that are impacted may not necessarily have the expertise. They're able to identify the symptoms, but the resolution of the symptoms may then bridge into many adjacent areas. Organizations are a network of functions. And when you have a push on one part of the network, it will ripple through that network. And oftentimes you'll have unattended consequences elsewhere because of those uh, linkages. This then requires some thought as to what those linkages are, where are the different points of expertise that are needed. And it's not only expertise to know how to fix the problem, but also some foresight as to what type of ripple effects might have of things over that might be overlooked. Then also, there's another one here. Who needs to be informed? Now, this is where you get into kind of a political issue in many in many ways in that people like to know what's going on but at the same time they don't have the time to know everything so this gets into how do you generate some type of communication to know what's going on without overly burdening uh, them oftentimes this is communicated through the rumor mill um, rumors will happen 
Okay. To the extent that you try to have any type of secrecy, that vacuum will be filled by people making sense of what they're seeing around them. To the extent that they're making sense without the full understanding or the full uh, transparency of what's going on, they're going to make sense as it fits within what they already know. Chances are that may be wrong and rumors in will oftentimes create unnecessary resistance just because they're not based upon a good understanding. But again, this gets back to the core issue that people like to be informed, but at the same time, they don't like to be bothered about having to be always involved. It's kind of a, a, a tricky situation. Uh, there's also the necessity of team building, of you know, people that are on the inside and know what's going on versus those that are outside don't know what's going on. People like to be uh, felt that they're an insider. So as part of the team building and that if you've got a team, everybody needs to be somehow involved, which gets into, the, again, the communication challenge and starts to bridge into the politics of who's involved, how they're involved, and uh, what's communicated. And there's also some of the um, covering your backside of to the extent that if you involve other people and it turns out to be uh, the wrong decision in hindsight, again, in hindsight is a critical point of view. At that point, if other people are involved, you don't necessarily have to take the blame all by yourself. You can say, well, it wasn't my decision. It was a group decision. And so again, this is kind of covering your mis uh your mistakes if they were to happen. This also gets into the cultural issue then as to who needs to be involved for uh, possible communicators, those that are network connectors that are able to communicate the message across the organization. How do you build uh, them into the organization uh, communication so that they can spread either formally or informally the message that needs to be carried forward? Okay. Let's talk about then about the different ways decisions can be made. Okay, and this starts to get back into the, the question. Oftentimes, the decisions are made by one person. Okay, but there's levels of involvement here. Okay, oftentimes people would just like to tell what the decision is, tell people what to do. They realize that that's not really feasible. Telling people will automatically create defensive uh, resistance. So they realize that telling doesn't work in most cases. So they resort to selling. And most change communication programs are built around selling, selling the idea either through a rational analysis or appealing to the emotions. Again, it's a selling. This leaves out two additional levels of how you involve people. And this gets back to involving uh, either small numbers of people that may be impacted or very large numbers of people. It gets into the testing of ideas or the consulting for better understanding. This involves people to the extent that you're asking them for advice. The advice might be uh, feedback on a particular solution that you're considering. Okay, is it good? What am I overlooking? Okay. The consulting goes a level deeper in that you're asking for input prior to coming up with a selection uh, possibility. So you can move then from telling people what to do to selling people on the idea, which is really um, a single person involved making the decision without real input from others. Okay. Then you've got various degrees of testing ideas on others or consulting. When you talk about large numbers of people, obviously you can't consult with each one individually, but you may be able to consult with small groups or identify key network uh, bridge people or the connectors in the network or people with particular known expertise, those that have personal powers of expertise and connection. You can reach out to them individually, or you can go to small uh, group meet settings and do small brainstorming. 
for very large types of feedback for, uh, in the area of testing, obviously you could do surveys. Uh, this could be attitudinal survey, uh, you know, identifying problem, see seeking agreement levels. So there's different things you could do for surveys uh, across a large number of people. But again, that requires some understanding of what types of questions need to be asked. So in many cases, before you develop the questionnaire or the survey instrument itself, you need to do some consulting to better understand, at least at a fundamental level, what needs to be asked of the larger group of people. So again, this gets back to how do you involve many people? And then it gets down to how do you test ideas across many people? How do you consult with uh, small individuals or groups within the larger? But again, this is all basically one person making decision with various degrees of how other people are involved. Then you get into the fifth level of involvement, which is co-creation. This is a team effort. This is where you've got more delegation of authority and decision-making. And there's different ways to put constraints around that. But the idea here is that the decision is not made by one person. It's a, a group effort. And there's different ways of approaching that type of of group effort. When you look at the probability of success for change, okay, telling will basically get you passive aggressive uh, behavior. Well, you're going to get some compliance as long as you've got pressure in the telling, but as soon as that pressure goes away, uh, the old behaviors will revert and nothing's really changed. The decision itself is a null at that point. Uh, selling is effective only to the extent that people will eventually come around to either understanding and accepting the rational basis in the sales, or they will uh, possibly understand it from an emotional standpoint and may go forward, not necessarily because they want to, but they're afraid not to. Okay. The testing and consulting then will involve people much more and leads into probably better decision making. But for full commitment, people need to be involved as part of the change and ideally then part of the decision making analysis that leads up to what is to be changed. This then gets into the different methodologies for making a decision. To some extent, if one person is making the decision, you could call that consensus, you know, consensus of one. Okay. So a lot of times in a very traditional organization, to the extent that the, uh, the decision maker slits its input from other, once they take that and test it, consult, they can then make a decision without any other further action. Okay. Uh, another approach is weighted ranking. Now, this is kind of an interesting point. And that weighted ranking for decision-making is in virtually every textbook on decision-making. It's where you look at a number of criteria, you weight it relative to the importance and then you add some probabilities. So it's very much of a statistical expected value type of an approach. Okay. What often happens though, is a lot of these are not necessarily a probability distribution. Many types of selection criteria come down to a binary, uh, yes, no. Okay. So for example, uh, years back, I was involved with a strategic reevaluation. We came up with 18 different options uh, going forward. Many of them fell out immediately. We didn't have the time. It was a binary decision. It was a zero, no time. Uh, we didn't have the expertise. We could have uh, developed the expertise, but we didn't have the time. So again, the expertise fell out or the expertise limited just to certain top, uh, certain options. Okay. Uh, we didn't have the funds. Again, funds can be... Uh, 
built up over time. Uh, funds can be used to buy the expertise. So you've got basically time, funds, expertise, any number of things that are, are all interrelated. But in each case individually, relative to the other constraints, they become binary decisions. You then end up with a few options on, you know, what do you want to do? What don't you want to do? The probabilities of success, the outcomes associated uh, with those different decisions. In reality, whenever I've seen weighted ranking done, for the most part, it's a list of criteria that are used as a filter, the zero one, uh, yes, no type of filter of the options, or a list of pro con. I can't remember of a full actual weighted decision where you do the full matrix that the textbook says and you come up with an answer. It's kind of a process for building that filter and the pro con list. And then it's a judgment at that point. Okay. This and also lays the groundwork for a growing methodology uh, of consent. This comes from uh, sociocracy and holacracy, where everybody has a say, but there is an implied approval of the decision question to the extent that you don't express a negative point of view. Okay. Your silence is taken as your agreement. And if you have a disagreement, you have to voice it in a meaningful way for discussion. Okay. This requires in some, some culture around the openness and the willingness of people to step forward. There's an implication that uh, if you're silent, you have no right to complain about the decision because you've missed your opportunity to voice your uh, your issue of dissent. Again, again, this is a gr growing use among organizations. It requires some team building, some culture, but to some extent, it's also a very clear way of making sure that you identify all of the issues because everybody who's involved has an opportunity to state a dissent. So let's go back to the bigger issue of 500 people. Okay. 500 people is a lot of people to get on board with a consensus. It's virtually impossible to get that type of group together. But at the same time, you can post a question to that group and give a vehicle for them to state their dissent and why they have a dissent with a smaller team possibly reviewing that and bringing the people in for further vocalization. So again, through a consent process, you can lay out a path as a test. This is a testing approach. You can lay it out as a test, but at the same time, really involve them of giving them a voice on what do they see that others may not see. This then requires obviously a feedback process that they know that they're being heard and are given some reasons of why their idea may not be necessarily accepted. So again, it's an open transparency process. But again, it it may appear that it takes a little bit longer because you're involving more people, you're giving them the option. And in sociocracy, there's a lot of process built around this. The uh, talking stick process where one person at a time talks, everybody has to listen. There's some very formal procedures in doing this. But again, if you keep it simple, and just give people the option to voice dissent, this then becomes a very uh, positive way of involving large numbers of people and finding out things that may go wrong later. Again, it may take a little bit more time up front, but 
later on in implementation, you're more likely to have a better solution. And the issues that people may bring up in this process are not going to go away. Okay. You either bring them up at the beginning of the decision-making process, or you address them in the implementation where you may have to deal with resistance or uh, change the change process itself. Okay. Now, in one case where I was involved with consensus, it goes back to that intensive business review where we got to the 18 different strategies we evaluated. This was a very long process. And I was explaining it once to a group of students in a strategic management course. And one student asked me, how did you make the decision? And that question stopped me because I could not remember of a single instance where we actually made a decision. This was a large international company with over 10,000 employees that made a dramatic strategic shift. But it was almost like a consensus process in that as we as we drilled down into the analysis, that analysis came up through the organization through a series of meetings and presentations. And as that process rippled up into the organization, it ended up in the boardroom with all the, the C-level executives. And I was part of the planning team coordinating all of that. And what was interesting is that as the presentations were made, questions came up. Those questions were pushed back down into the organizations. And then days or weeks later, they would ripple back up through the organization. Through this process of involving people throughout the organization by bringing ideas forward, their analysis, their recommendations forward, and having at each level as it came up the organization, questioning and pushing those questions back down, we ended up with basically coming to an understanding. It was, a, it was really a sense-making process. And then by the time we got to the end, everyone was pretty much in agreement of understanding what the issue was, the, uh, the constraints, the opportunities, and a relative feel relative to the filter of what was possible. And then it got down to the end of really making a choice between, you know, like two or three options that were really feasible, all somewhat similar. And it was kind of like a group of people getting together, talking about where you're going to go for lunch, you know, options come up, uh, people make suggestions, and it just kind of happens. And that's the way this, this process happened. We made, you know, a multi, multi really billion dollar decision through a sense-making process, just through how people were involved. Okay. But again, this was really over about almost an 18-month process that led to a massive strategic reorientation for the company. But once it was made, because everyone throughout the organization was really involved with this up-down question presentation process, everyone pretty much knew what was needed to be done, where their existing jobs fit, and those that did not fit were, were basically moved around into other spots where they were needed. So I can't think of any layoffs. Now, there were, there were some obvious layoffs leading into this process that was a, basically a survival. You know, we ended up laying off about a quarter of the organization for a survival uh, but that survival step bought us the 18 months to really do the process right. So again, this was basically a consensus process that took a long time, but worked very well. Consent could uh, obviously have a similar type, uh, but be a little bit quicker. Okay. Then you also get into a mindset. And I was thinking about this in that the decisions themselves fall within some type of way the organization thinks about how they operate. Uh, and let me go into some details about this. Okay. Causation is a traditional way that organizations operate. Okay. They develop goals and then they figure out how to resource 
those goals. They So again, the goals come first and then they're resourced. And the strategic uh, reorientation that I mentioned earlier, this was basically what we did. We, we came up with goals and then we looked at the resources we had available to us and that then was filtered out of which ones we did not have the resources, we did not have the time, the expertise, or the funds uh, to buy that time or expertise. So again, it's goal-driven. Okay. Also, as part of a traditional approach is a risk management mindset. The risk management mindset is really a probability analysis. You look at the range of things that may go wrong, the implications of what were to happen, should that opportunity or uh, challenge occur, and then assign a probability to it. So when you get down to a strategic analysis, this is often done through a uh, risk reward basis that is probability based with a, an expected value. And the risk is often then looked at uh, the problem of how do you decrease the negative points, uh, increase the positive points, and address it, particularly if the risks uh, have a, a net negative. So but again, the challenge here, though, it is a probability basis. So a very low probability with a very large impact will still be very low factored in because of low probability. But should that probability happen, then you have the full impact. This is where the challenges of risk management uh, then occurs. And that is not necessarily the probability that's involved, but the impact of that probability should it happen. So this requires then not only trying to mitigate the risk, but also a lot of advanced notification should those risks be, be occurring or trending in that direction. This is a traditional way that organizations look at the decision-making process. Goal-driven resources follow uh, the goals. Okay. Effectuation is really an entrepreneurial point of view. This looks at resources first. So instead of looking at the goals and then figuring out resources that are needed and how to figure out and then determining how to get those resources, the decision-making process looks at the available resources first and then sets the goals based upon those resources. Okay. This is an entrepreneurial standpoint because the entrepreneurs don't have the ability to easily procure additional resources. They look at what they've got and work from there. Now, obviously, they do a few other things through partnership. To the extent that you partner with others in the organization or even strategic partners with other suppliers or customers, or even in some cases, maybe competitors, you then expand the resources available to you you are obviously then sharing in the benefits of that decision. But the key point here is that you are basically making more possibilities available to you through those partnerships. So the resources may not only be what you have currently, but what you have through your network of partnerships. The effectuation approach also looks at risk much differently. Okay. It looks at the risk from an affordability standpoint. Can you afford it if it, the risk were to happen? So, for example, in a risk management, you may have a low probability, high impact. Okay. That may then be filtered out and lead to an acceptable decision because of the low probability. For an effectuation standpoint, though, because of that large impact, the question comes is not what is the probability of that impact. The question then comes is, can I afford that risk if it were to happen? At that point, you may then choose not to do it, or you figure out a way to offload that risk to someone else through insurance, partnership, or any number of ways. It's a business choice. So again, 
The traditional way is, is goal driven versus resource driven. It's an expected value for risk versus can you afford the worst case situation? This is a different way then of having a mindset that drives the overall process itself. We then get into the selection criteria and there's a, a lot of things here. Uh, okay, qu question raise hand, go ahead. Yes, before we move on to the next right. um, point, I just, I'll, I'm just curious if you can perhaps go back to the previous slide. Yes, the effect creation. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's a model. But then once I read this, and and because based on your explanation, you said that, so the first identify the, the resources that are available. And then based on that, um, that will then drive the goal setting. Right. And um, I can see myself talking about it. And immediately people talk will bring up the Parkinson law. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And it basically says that time will expand as to fill up the, okay, wait. Um, I just want to find it again to just say it properly. So the, the idea, it says that time will expand to fill up the time that, it, oh, okay, sorry, work will expand to fill up the time that is available. That is what the law says. Okay. okay. So what this means then is that um, when you're looking at, if you, you have to look at the resources that are available and you then base your goal on those resources, I feel like you will not, um, your goals will not be as, as big as they can possibly be. Um, and 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 as forward as it can possibly be because they are quite limited to the resources um, that are available. For example, if your resource is time and you're telling yourself that, um, you know, sort of you'll complete it uh, within a week, um, you'll find that the work will expand itself to, to fill up that time, um, if that makes sense. So I just, yeah, yeah for, for people who think like that, I just... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And again, <clears throat> these are two ends of a spectrum. And this does not say that you're all causation or all effectuation. Even in traditional organizations, there may be little pockets here and there of startup ideas. Uh, so, for example, it might be a, um, a new product search. Okay, that new product search may limit itself to an effectuation pro process because their current process is uh, rapidly uh, diminishing in market share due to competition or uh, changes in supplier cost, any number of things. So again, the a large organization may be primarily driven by goals, but certain areas, little pockets, and decisions associated with those pockets may be driven by resources. Okay. So again, it, there's a spectrum. The key is to not overly rely upon one versus the other. And you're, and you're right in saying that the goals may not be as big if you're driven by resource constraints. Okay. That is why a critical component then is building strategic partnerships. A strategic partnership will increase the resources that have potential benefits in the future. You may not necessarily need that strategic partnership now, but down the road, you may. Okay. So, for example, uh, there was a, a case I just read recently about, um, I think it was, I think it was App, Apple and uh, Apple and Intel. Apple and Intel were talking about graphic processors and Intel was wanting to formalize the agreement, non-disclosures and everything else. And Apple came back and says, you know, let's keep, you know, basically let's keep this informal. We want to go quicker. Um, and if something were to come out of our conversations, then we'll deal with how we formalize it. So again, the idea then of effectuation is that it allows you to go quicker. You may not necessarily go as big, but you're doing a trade-off there of going quicker. Okay. Now, by going quick doesn't necessarily mean that you that you have to take all the big things off the table. You could keep the, the big ideas on the table and look for other partners, look for other resources, but don't limit yourself 
on making decisions right now, moving forward as quick as possible. So again, this gets into the mindset of how you blend the two um, and gets into the localization, the long-term impact, classification of the problem. Is that a problem that needs an immediate solution? If it needs an immediate solution, then you need to lean toward more of the effectuation because it goes quicker. If it's a slowly developing uh, challenge, then you could take a look at the traditional uh, goal resource because you've got the, uh, the possibilities there. Or if you need some short-term wins, you can then use the effectuation for the short-term wins that get you to the long-term traditional causation for goal setting. So you're able to mix the two. Okay. Do you kind of understand that becomes a, a, a mindset blending at that point? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks okay. for that. Okay. Uh, let me then jump ahead then. Uh, and again, I'm still building, building out these. This is the you know, selection criteria. Is it feasible? Do you have the resources, time and uh, money? Uh, is it politically acceptable? Again, this is oftentimes a, uh, a critical issue in very politicized uh, traditional organizations where you've got people in uh, critical positions of power and authority. If it doesn't uh, satisfy them, you're just wasting your time. Okay. Uh, is it alignment? Okay. Alignment, I, I thought off first, just purpose alignment. A lot of what we talk about in the Futocracy Network is purpose alignment, but it's also an alignment with the values. But to some extent, there's also some strategic alignment because if it's not aligned with the strategy, then it calls into question, are you building a different strategy? Are you then losing some cohesion as to direction? So again, the selection criteria has a number of alignment issues. Uh, there's probably also some other issues for alignment relative to personal agendas uh, themselves. Uh, in that if people want, if you want to get people committed to it, it's got to align with their vision on why they're working uh, where they are. Okay. Uh, you then also get into selection criteria of quick action versus analysis paralysis. Uh, I worked with one company. Uh, I ended up leaving it. Uh, primarily because I felt that I wasn't accomplishing anything. Uh, my earlier work uh, was getting into the point of every time I came up with a, a, a good project, uh, they would come up with more questions. Uh, I'd address those questions and they come up with more questions. Again, this was a parent organization that was very, very, very risk adverse. To them, making no, no decision was safer than making any decision that may be wrong, because if they made a wrong decision, their career was in jeopardy. So they were then rewarded with identifying possible problems with the decision and disincentified by making any decision that may be wrong. So again, uh, I got frustrated and ended up leaving after a while. Again, the quick decision also has to be somewhat simple and easily understood if it requires a lot of explanation and uh, time to get people to understand not only the end objective, but how they need to be involved in making that transition. Then it becomes more prob probability of having some uh, issues arrive, uh, not necessarily with the decision itself, but the implementation of that decision. And then you, the other alignment then gets into other recent requests, the synergies. Uh, do you have passionate and collaborative customers and suppliers, people that have similar interests? And the recency also is critical here. On um, Are they asking for it now or very recent? Or is this like an old request that may have already been solved to the extent that a customer asked something a year ago, they may have already solved that challenge themselves or found somebody else to solve it for them. And that request is uh, limited value because it's no longer valid because it's old. So again, this is a synergies of how does this decision fit, fit with other decisions that have been made in the past? 
You also then get into an interesting bias of a selection criteria on what brings team happiness. And this is kind of interesting because it's really an internal looking of alignment with people's values and what they want out of their job, what they enjoy doing. Uh, and it's really kind of an interesting point of view that's often overlooked in decision-making of what would people like to do. But when I go back to that strategic reorientation where we came up with really consensus, this was almost the, the tiebreaker at the end on what would people like to do and what they were excited about. And to the extent that they were excited about that as a possibility, it kind of moved the overall thinking in that direction. So when you looked at a consensus building, it was a slow sense building exercise with a happiness indicator kind of thrown in at the end, even though it was an emergent process that it wasn't until years later that I thought about what the process actually was within this framework. Okay. Um, this is kind of at the end of uh, our hour. What I've got right now, I've got a few more things that I'll probably be putting out in discussion uh, uh, questions. Any, any questions at this point? of anything I've talked about or that may need to be brought forward in the next uh, two two parts? Um, no, I think I was asking questions as as, I was, as we were going, so I'm, okay. I'm quite uh, okay. Okay. Because I've got a few more things coming up here as the categories of questions, the, uh, and again, what I want to talk about uh, on the session two weeks from today, We'll be looking at what are companies doing now than to put this into place through distributed decision making, uh, distributing the authority for those decisions, and how are they doing it in such a way that there's still some control. And this gets into the challenge then of rethinking of what control is. A lot of times when we talk about control, it's a top-down delegation of authority for decision-making. Uh, and it's also a performance measurement system that basically keeps people um, constrained relative to what they're doing. Okay. So it's a pos it's then a traditional approach is a controls, which is really very hard. The authority is a very hard control. The performance metrics is also very hard versus a soft control of thinking about principles, principles that enable what can happen, but also a, a, a tension type of principle, such that one principle pushes in one direction, but another principle pushes back, such that you've got things in tension so that people can take action, but not go, uh, not go crazy. So you're able to distribute the decision making without giving them uh, total authority to go uh, do crazy things. This then gets into a principle based, which is also a control, but it's a soft control because it's kind of built into the system itself. I'll be talking about that in the next uh, two sessions. I'm going to try to keep this somewhat informal. So to the extent that any questions come up, uh, please jump in. Because as I was developing this presentation, it was somewhat of a learning uh, process. Uh, a lot of times when I start to put ideas together, I see some adjacent ideas and it starts to make a little more sense as I go along. But let me pull up my screen here.